War is hell. War is chaos. War is terrifying. But can it also be spooky? The American Civil War, quite rightly, has gone down in history as a blood-soaked trauma. It saw a terrible loss of life and literally tried to tear the United States apart. But like all wars and battles, myths, legends and unbelievable tales spring up and the American Civil War is no exception. Our tale today comes from 1862 and the gruelling Battle of Shiloh. Two Union armies had combined to defeat the Confederate Army of Mississippi. Major General Ulysses S. Grant was the Union commander, while General Albert Sidney Johnston was the Confederate general until his battlefield death, when he was replaced by his second-in-command, General Beauregard. The Confederates hoped to defeat Grant's army before it could be reinforced and resupplied. Although a surprise attack during the first day of the battle gained some success, Johnston was mortally wounded and Grant's army was not eliminated. Overnight, Grant's army was reinforced by one of its divisions stationed further north. The next morning, the northern forces launched an unexpected counterattack, which reversed the Confederate gains of the previous day. The exhausted Confederate army withdrew further south. The Union army pursued but their pursuit ended the very next day. Though victorious, the Union army had more casualties than the Confederates, and Grant was heavily criticised. The battle was the costliest engagement of the Civil War up to that point, and its nearly 24,000 casualties made it one of the bloodiest battles in the entire war. As men hacked and gouged at each other from dawn to dusk, many of the wounded had to be left to fend for themselves. Neither the Union or Confederate armies possessed medical services that were capable of dealing with such a huge number of casualties. So as darkness fell after both days fighting, many men were left lying in the field. A soldier recalls the rain and dismal conditions during the battle. I had no blanket. It had been raining and the ground was damp and muddy. I lay down having only my gun under me to keep me out of the mud and my cartridges dry. I did not lie long before I was sound asleep, and lay there until I was aroused by the rain which began to fall. I covered my face and slept on for some time. At last after getting thoroughly soaked. I arose and attempted to enter the tent of Lieutenant Breckenridge. About midnight we were awakened, with orders to fall in. The rain began to fall in torrents. The darkness was so intense that I could scarcely see my file leader. Passing on the more gloomy sights and sounds I could scarcely imagine. I have said it was dark, but frequent vivid peals of flashes of lightning, rent the heavens and revealed objects clearly all around. Then when the veil of night was rent and the curtain of darkness was lifted it was then sickening sights fell before my eyes. Near me at one time lay a dead man, his clothes ghastly, bloody face turned up to the pattering raindrops that fell fast upon that brow cold in death. Dead men were all around, one sitting against a bank and leaning his head upon his hands and knees. The position was as natural as if he had fallen asleep, yet he was dead. Near us where we lay in line of battle was a dead body. Some of our men very coolly examined his wounds and took his cartridges. Another boy not far off with his hat over his face. In vain I attempted to close my eyes to these shocking spectacles, wherever I turned I saw men pale in death. Saw pale faces upturned and caked with mud and water. Hair matted with gore and hair. Oh it was too shocking, too horrible. God grant that I may never be the partaker in such scenes again. My resolution is set. When released from this I shall ever be an advocate of peace. The Shiloh battlefield was a wet and swampy area and far too many men lay in this filthy mud and foul water for hours. On top of this, to make things worse, there was a lot of rain about, especially on the first night. It was a colossal effort, therefore, to clear the battlefield of wounded, and the mud and rain just made this task even more difficult. But as the inadequate medical services started their struggle to get the wounded men away from the mud, the muck and the rain, as the wounded were brought back and placed in tents to receive treatment, something strange started to happen. Something totally bizarre, totally unseen before, and totally eerie. 
some of the men's wounds began to glow. As the field ambulances, surgeons and assistants began their work, they were astonished to see some wounds lit by a bluey-green luminescent glow. This ghostly phenomenon was quickly called Angel's Glow, as the men with the luminescent wounds were reported to be healing better and have less scarring than the men who did not have this unusual glow. It was also stated that the men with the glowing wounds also experienced fewer infections and a higher survival rate. Now this sounds like folklore and legend, like the angels at the Battle of Mons. The retreating British were saved by angels, like the archers from Agincourt in the sky shooting arrows at the pursuing Germans. But is there any science to back up this seemingly incredible story? In 2001, two high school students in a science fair put forward an explanation for the angel's glow phenomenon. may seem a strange topic to cover at a science fair, but one of the boys, William Martin, had a mother who was a microbiologist. She has always insisted that she helped, but it was all their idea, and they did the work themselves. It all centres on a tiny parasitic worm called a nematode. These creatures harbour a bacteria called Photohabdus luminescens, which actually glows in the dark. The worm usually prefers to tunnel into an insect and vomit out its bacteria. As soon as the bacteria killed the insect host, the worm would then feast on the corpse. But what makes this nematode worm interesting is that it not only kills the insect it has infected, but also any competing bacteria it might find. So the boy's theory was that the worms were attracted to the insects that had gathered around gruesome wounds. When in and around these insects, they would vomit their bacteria in and around the wound as well. This, in their theory, would make the wounds glow, and at the same time, kill any bacteria that would be gathering in the wounds, therefore reducing infection and potentially increasing survival rates. But there is a problem with the nematode theory. The bacteria from the worms do not generally colonise wounds in the warm 37 degrees environment of the human body, preferring the cooler conditions found inside soil. So if this bacteria could not survive, then there would be no glow. But the boys had a solution to it. The Battle of Shiloh took place in early April, when temperatures were still pretty cool. On top of this, the wounded men involved had lain out for long periods of time in wet, cold, muddy ground and had been rained on. It is likely that many soldiers developed hypothermia. This would drive down body temperatures to levels not lethal to the good bacteria. But can this also provide an explanation for why the soldiers did not develop photohabdus luminescence infections? Well, yes. When the men were taken to hospitals, or even tents to be treated, they would have been under shelter, around other men, and perhaps wrapped in blankets. In other words, they would have been warmed up, killing off the photohabdus luminescence, preventing it from causing an infection. So there we have it. What do you think? Was it an actual instance of glowing wounds due to illuminescent worms? Or was it just a trick of the light, perhaps atmospheric conditions and the position of the sun, or exhausted soldiers seeing things after the hell of a two-day battle? Let us know in the comments below. If you've enjoyed this video, then make sure you take a look here at the incredible tale of an American soldier who loaded his rifle 23 times without firing it. Thanks for watching.